everybody. Hello. Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, as many of you know, I am Dr. Somi Marotero. I am the director of the Folklore Institute and a member of the Folklore and um, Ethnomusicology Colloquium Committee. And I am very pleased to welcome you to this lecture. Uh, our, we have a theme for this year, and our theme is Artistry and Presence in Society and the Environment. And this is the second of our three lectures for this semester. I want to thank my co-committee members, Rebecca Dirksen, Joseph Johnson, and Holly Matthews for all the work they did in making today possible and all the other lectures um, that we've been planning. And also, I really want to thank Michelle Melhouse, Angus Burke, and Emily Long for all of their work that they've done to put all of the details together. Thank you so much. Um, I have a reminder. We have a colloquium, our last colloquium will be on December 3rd at 4 p.m. It's gonna be at the IMU in the Dogwood Room and our own Gloria Colon, who is a PhD candidate um, in folklore, will be presenting her talk, a retrospective on bata, Batata Batata, and that comes from a chapter that she did, a visual um, essay that she did for the book that I co-edited with um, Mitzi Martinez Rivera, Theorizing Folklore from the Margins. So please catch that um, when, if you can. So I am over the moon to be pleasing, uh, to be, to be uh, introducing our speaker today. I, this is just a great, great honor for me. Before I get started, I want to read a little poem. Um, it's called um, Little Prayer, and it's by Danes Smith. And they are a poet from St. Paul, Minnesota as well. Little Prayer. Let ruin end here. Let him find honey where there was once a slaughter. Let him enter the lion's cage and find a field of lilacs. Let this be the healing, and if not, let it be. It is with great pleasure that I get to introduce our speaker for the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology Colloquium Series this afternoon. My friend and colleague, Dr. David Todd Lawrence, is an associate professor and director of graduate programs in the Department of English at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. I got to know Todd as a member of the American Folklore Society Executive Board. His humor, kindness, and intelligence always warmed me and make me look forward to the work we were all doing together for the society. Todd teaches African American literature and expressive culture, folklore studies, and cultural studies. His writing has appeared in the Journal of American Folklore, Southern Folklore, The Griot, Open Rivers, and The New Territory, and soon in the Journal of Folklore Research. His book, When They Blew the Levy, Race, Politics, and Community in Put and Hook, um, is from 2018 and is co-authored with Elaine Lawless. And it's an eth ethnographic project done in collaboration with the residents of Pinhook, Missouri, in an African-American town destroyed during the Mississippi River flood of 2011. This last book was the recipient of the prestigious 2019 Chicago Folklore Prize. He is also the co-director of the Urban Art Mapping Project. Today, he will, be present, he will be presenting The Soul to See, The Courage to Fail, Ethnography, Relationships, and Social Change. Please join me in welcoming Professor David Todd Introduction. It always is sort of like um, disconcerting when you get introduced at something like this and you're like, I you make me sound much better than I actually am, so thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Lily, and thank you all for inviting me to be here today to give this talk. Um, everyone's been so nice to me. I felt so welcomed here. I came in yesterday and the, you know, the kindness and everything has just been nonstop, so thank you all and everybody that I've met with and talked with already. Thank you so much for being here generous with your time and all of that. Um, so I'm going to talk today, I'm not going to have any pictures, so I hope that's not a problem. Um, I thought long and hard about, you know, whether I would do a, a sort of uh, audio visual with this, but I decided not to. I kind of want to keep it more simple. It is a little bit long, so I'm going to read this. It, it, it has three parts, and I think I will put it this way. It's basically a discovery, a story, and a manifesto at the very end. And um, I hope you can follow along with me. Um, so I had the wonderful opportunity to participate in an AFS forum a few weeks ago that built upon the extraordinary 2020 Utney lecture by Dana, uh, Diana Njai, Anand Pallad, 
and John Roberts. Um, the talks that comprised that lecture were for me and for many of us more inspired, more than inspiring. They were like a breath of air for lung, to lungs struggling for oxygen. They were like ice cold water in the middle of the desert. They were like an articulation of an undeniable resistance to the conventional assumptions of folklore and its historical practice. The words uh, of these three elders served as a kind of permission and blessing for those of us who have been budding against the orthodoxy of folklore since we first discovered folklore was a thing. I have heard so many young BIPOC scholars talk about their joy of discovering folklore only to be followed closely by the discomfort of learning that folklore wanted them to leave part of themselves behind. It didn't want them to bring their entire selves through the door. We find ourselves then as fugitives within the discipline trying uh, to find ways to liberate ourselves from the strictures of folklore study so that we can do work that is vital and necessarily engaged with issues that plague our discipline as much as they plague our world. The last time I visited the Folklore and Ethnomusicology Department at IU, I spent some time with the free bookshelf, which is right outside of Michelle's office, right? Um, and there were a lot more books on it last time I was here. Uh, on that shelf was a paperback book with no text on the cover, just an image of a star quilt pattern block on the front and back. I pulled it off the shelf and opened it up, and to my amazement, it was the published proceedings of the third annual meeting of the Association of African and African American Folklorists from 1979, which had been held in Bloomington. The collection was edited by Adrian Seward and contained pieces by all manner of black folklorists, including Daryl Dance, um, the teacher of one of my mentors, Anand Prahlad. The book included the schedule for the conference, which ended with a forum called New Perspectives in African and African American Folklore Areas for Exploration. Participating in this forum, along with Gerald Davis, Catherine Morgan, Gladys Marie Fry, William Wiggins Jr., and others, was the current president-elect of AFS Marilyn White, then of Western Kentucky University. Reading this rather hefty collection of writing by black folklorists has been fascinating and enlightening for me. Um, the book contains a whole section on the, quote, discipline of African American folklore. In one of the articles included in that section, Calvin Jason Dotson makes the case for subject subjectivity in folklore research, arguing that we must uh, that we should apply it to our to our data and that we should use it in an analysis of the discipline itself. He argues, quote, black folklorists cannot hope to correct past mistakes and misconceptions um, still lingering in the literature and in the esprit de corps of the discipline by being objective. For we are dealing with human beings and human responses to specific social conditions, not handling rocks or observing falling objects. We are dealing with the ethos and pathos of a people. We are uniquely a part of what we analyze, and we may therefore bring our, per our personal experiences and that of our immediate families to, hear, to bear on the subject, uh, on the study of African American folklore. We will not cease being scholars as a result. In 1979, Scholars of color were then pushing against the discipline of folklore studies. That is, its desire to discipline us as scholars and keep us on the plantation, if you will. Well, this brings me back to the forum from a month ago, toppling folklore's racist monuments, paths, and approaches for a liberatory, abolitionist, justice-centered, equity-based, and decolonial uh, folkloristics, during which my fellow BIPOC folklorists picked up and ran with the baton, not just of Diana, Prahlad, and John, but of all of those folklorists from that meeting in 1979, as well as those many folklorists of color before them, we advocated for a new folkloristics that, as our colleague Junius Brickhouse said, begins at home. We continue to resist folklore's efforts to discipline us, for as one of the panelists said during the forum, and I can't remember, I wish I could remember who said this, folklore cannot be the overseer, it must be the safe house. I very much hope that my work as a folklorist is in line with those who have come before me and those who are my colleagues and collaborators. I'm the product of two teachers with different but reconcilable philosophies and approaches. From Anam Prahlad, I learned that folklore is the air we breathe, the liquid we are all immersed in, the substance that connects us and allows us to make meaning and build community with each other. Elaine taught me how to listen with commitment, how to work in collaborative ways, how to be vulnerable and present, and present when I am with people I'm working with. More recently, Prahlad, who once told me as a grad student that ethnography was always exploitative and he wasn't going to do it anymore, remarked about ethnography just a few years ago as we sat at opposite ends of an AFS panel, that maybe we should embrace that fact and that the most valuable thing we bring to the ethnographic moment is the gift of our presence. 
Elaine had already shown me by that time that failure would always be a part of that moment as well. Elaine and I worked in collaboration with the Displaced Community of Pinhook, Missouri for eight years. The experiences I had during that collaboration have had a profound influence on me and how I think today. Um, working with members of this community for so long meant we had to consistently think about the project, our relationships, and what, if anything, was being accomplished. We felt so many times that we were failing to the point that I began to understand it as an unavoidable feature of our work. It was not until after we finished our book that I understood that embracing that failure was a necessary companion to vulnerability and true collaborative work. Like many other things they taught us, the people of Pinhook helped me to understand and accept that fact. On the evening of May 2nd, 2011, Pinhook was destroyed when the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers intentionally breached the Birds Point levee, causing the Mississippi River to rush into the floodway, completely submerging the village as well as 130,000 acres of farmland under more than 20 feet of water. For nearly seven years after the breach, the residents of Pinhook were forced to live with family and friends in nearby towns such as Sykeson and East Prairie, and cities as far away as Kansas City, St. Louis, and Memphis. Displaced residents, also uh, residents whose homes were destroyed, have still never received disaster aid or restitution from the federal government. They received no logistical or financial assistant in, in assistance in finding other places to live during their displacement. Only recently have some of the displaced residents who lost their homes and most of their possessions received any financial assistance in rebuilding their lives. In April of 2018, Mennonite Disaster Services with local, uh, with volunteer Amish laborers completed this uh, construction of seven houses uh, on a residential street in southeast Sykes, southeastern Sykeston, Missouri, along with two additional homes built in nearby communities. The construction of these houses was partially funded by the Missouri Department of Economic Development in partnership with Boot Hill Regional Planning Commission, both state agencies. The amount provided for each family was not nearly enough to buy land and build new homes. So the aid of MDS and volunteer laborers was essential to the construction of these new dwellings. So after seven long years of lobbying, stumping, and writing grant applications, some of the originally displaced residents of Pinnock received new houses and even more, even new furniture but their town, which was destroyed by an act of the federal government, will never be uh, rebuilt. When Elaine and I started working on this project in the spring of 2011, each of us had questions we wanted answered about the destruction of the village of Pinhook. Elaine, who first brought my attention to the disaster, struggled to comprehend how she could have grown up just a few miles away from Pinhook in Benton, Missouri, having never known that the town even existed. I wanted to understand how an entire town could have been destroyed without anyone ever consulting the residents of that town, or as displaced Pinhook residents later told us, without anyone giving them effective notification that the debt levy would, be, would even be breached. As we met and interviewed the people of Pinhook, spending more and more time with them, we became as interested in the origins of their town and the bonds of community as their, as their narratives of the disaster and its aftermath. We also became concerned with advocacy. We wanted to try to bring the story of Pinhook to the attention of as many people as possible. We hoped to be a part of an effort that would see Pinhook rebuilt and all of its residents continue reunited in a new, safer location, away from the threat of the Missouri River and the power of the Army Corps of Engineers to flood their homes. We interviewed as many displaced people as we could. We even made a short documentary film that we hoped would be used uh, to raise awareness about the plight of the community. We intended to write a book about the displaced residents of the town featuring their own narratives of their experience. Over the many years we worked on these projects, many of these same residents became our friends. They never treated us as interlopers from the university nearby or journalists who would come get their story and leave. They accepted us, insisting that we were family. As Deborah Robinson, our first and longtime collaborator, told us during an interview, and I was trying to assure her at the time, that we would never act on our own in any way regarding Pinhook without seeking her permission first. She said, this is the third time I'm going to tell you this, and I ain't going to say this no more. You are a family. From the first day we met you in Elaine, you became a part of our family, our Pinhook family. And from the bottom of my heart, I know that you wouldn't do anything to hurt us at all. We considered this our official conferral of credentials, our initiation into the Pinhook family. But of course, in ethnographic field research, what we want to be true often isn't. Despite what Deborah told us on that June day, 
the truth would always be more complicated. I have no doubt that Deborah genuinely meant what she said, but how could she speak for every single displaced Pinhook resident? Despite her position of leadership as the mayor of Pinhook, how could she endow us with insider status on behalf of everyone? How could we, who only came to the boot hill once or twice a year, really ever be family? From the very beginning, Elaine and I have struggled with the conflicting nature of our status as researchers from outside on one hand and adopted family members and advocates on the other. We both uh, brought with us into the field complex subjectivities, to borrow Amy Schumann's term, uh, multiple and conflicting identity positions that gained us both insider and outsider status contingent upon the situation. We are both from Missouri. I lived there for much of my life, attending high school in southeast corner of the state, college in Kansas City, and graduate school in Columbia. Elaine was born in the boot heel. Um, she spent her entire career teaching at the University of Missouri, Columbia. This geographic proximity often served as a bridge when we conducted interviews with Pinhook residents and others from southeast Missouri. But Elaine is also white. While nearly all of the Pinhook resident res research collaborators are black, as am I, this was a mostly unstated but very real distinction that clearly was a consideration for some of our collaborators. We both had connections and distance from the Pinhook folk. My blackness, for example, along with the fact that a second cousin of my father, now deceased, happened to run the largest black-owned uh, funeral home in Charleston, which is a town about 10 minutes away from where Pinhook was, gave me some valuable credibility. Uh, my dreadlocks and faraway Minnesota home did not. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever Elaine and I spend time with Pinhook folks, we experience a consistently unstable positionality based on who we were, what we looked like, how we talked, where we came from, and who we knew. It was hard sometimes to tell how Pinhook folks felt about us. Through it all, we made every effort to convey um, to our research collaborators that we were on their side, that we cared about them. Our simplest most, but most convincing demonstration of this, we thought, was the fact that we returned to see them many times. With Deborah's declaration in mind, we began to see ourselves on some level as agents of advocacy who would try to help right the wrongs done to the people of Pinhook. We always acknowledged the work that Deborah and other Pinhook residents had already done, but we also developed a romanticized vision of what might be possible for us to accomplish in collaboration with them or on their behalf. This notion of ourselves as advocates emerged most noticeably when we were away from Pinhook giving talks or screening our film. Um, when, doing the, when doing so, we assumed authority and position to speak on behalf of Pinhook and its residents. In her article on the Verge Phenomenology and uh, Empathetic Unsettlement, Schumann offers an antidote to this impulse to, quote, recruit our subjects to occupy particular social positions. Invoking Gatcher Spivak, she explains, quote, the challenge for folklorists might be to describe strategic romanticism, a recognition of our complicity in the invention of our subjects as misrecognized, disappearing, or stigmatized, for example, and the recognitions of positions we assign ourselves as rescuers or brokers, for example. Um, we conspire emotionally as well uh, as intellectually to invent a pathetic other and attempt to correct misrecognitions uh, or disparage the disappearance of that other. Even as Elaine and I recognize and praise the resilience of displaced Pinhook residents fighting for justice, we also spoke about them, them as unheard, neglected, ignored, and invisible. We stood forth as their defenders, as what Elaine has called their, quote, aggrieved advocates. We positioned ourselves and our work um, in, position, in opposition to the amorphous they who had committed an injustice against the people who had adopted us as family. And we endeavored conscientiously, but ultimately unsuccessfully, to rectify their situation. All through the years that we worked with the people of Pinhook, we struggled in one way or another with that notion of strategic romanticism. Initially, we constructed, um, uh, we constructed them as, as a people in need, a group we could help. And yet, we didn't really know um, what that help would look like, what it would require. The truth, of course. One that we discovered along the way was that Pinhookians had already been working on their own behalf, lobbying politicians, sending out publicity packages, stumping on social media, and talking to any and every journalist who would come their way. They were already telling their own story in ways that would never be, we would never be able to. So what was it we were really offering to them? Unable to answer this question through the passing years, Elaine and I come to see, came to see ourselves as having failed the people of Pinhook, as having been unable to effect any real change for them. This led us, in turn, to begin considering the very real possibility that more than failing them, we had benefited inordinately from our relationship with them, exploiting them for our own advancement. 
Elaine discussed this discomfort in a paper she gave at AFS in 2014. In it, she bemoaned the possibility that we had been exploitative in our work with Pinhook residents and had taken from them, leaving them behind, quote, unsupported, unloved, heartbroken, and homeless. She commented further, quote, we made uh, or certainly implied promises that we, couldn't, that we couldn't keep. We made the film, we made, built a website, we told their story to audiences from Missouri to Norway. Yet in the end, we offered hope that, we could, that could not be realized and left. I thought at the time, and I still do, that this was a pretty unforgiving assessment of what Elaine and I had done in our work. But slowly, I began to realize and accept this thinking as part of Elaine's vigilant attention to the work, a radical conscientiousness around ethnographic research um, that was an essential element of her commitment, uh, her committed approach to, to field work, part of a larger model of interaction that contains uh, reciprocal ethnography and other approaches to field work that seek ultimately a radical form of collaboration. This endeavor requires consistent negotiation, uh, uh, attention, evaluation, calibration, and most importantly, vulnerability. Each time that Elaine and I would drive from Missouri uh, back to, from the Boot Hill, back to Columbia, Missouri, where I would drop her off and go on to Kansas City and then finally home to St. Paul. In those four hours of driving, we would attempt to begin again the work of negotiating, attending, evaluating, and being vulnerable about the time we had just spent with our collaborators. We would interrogate ourselves relentlessly about the interactions we had just had, picking over every single moment we could remember that seemed significant and many that initially hadn't. I remember frequently being surprised that she seemed so uncertain at times often full of self-doubt about what we were doing and whether it would help anyone. In the classroom, she always seemed so assured uh, of what she was teaching us, but in the field, I witnessed the difficulty, the uncertainty, the anxiety, the vulnerability that accompanied the field work we were engaged in. I'd always felt this way myself when I embarked on previous ethnographic projects, but I thought these feelings were uh, my own shortcomings as a researcher. I thought I wasn't really cut out to do the work. Watching Elaine in the field uh, but especially talking to her in the car afterward revealed to me the ways that this kind of discomfort with the work was actually a valuable part of the constant interrogation of self required for collaborative ethnography. These four-hour posts, fieldwork seminars became a kind of verbal journaling that allowed us to process our experiences and attempt to reobserve, re-experience, re-listen with our collaborators more and more centered in our consideration about what had occurred. More often than not, our long conversations would leave us feeling that we had made profound mistakes, that we had missed vitally important details, that we had failed in some way or another. Yet still, the feeling of failure was never enough to make us quit. Elaine kept going, and so did I. All the while, I knew these sessions were vital to our project. However, I didn't quite recognize their full importance until later, when we were forced to confront a particularly glaring tension between our conceptual framework regarding what had happened to the people of Pinhook and one held by the Pinhook residents themselves. In the spring of 2018, seven long years after the initial levee breach, some of the displaced residents of Pinhook, Missouri, got new houses. It was a great moment, the culmination of years of hard work led by Deborah and other Pinhook residents. Like many of those residents, we were reluctant to believe that the rebuilding of their houses would ha actually happen. For years, we'd received phone calls and text messages from Deborah telling us that there was a breakthrough through, only to find out that something had gone wrong. In recent years, she herself had even been much more reluctant to get excited about the prospect of any positive possibility. But this was the most promising eventuality that had, ha that had presented itself in a long time. And when Amish workers actually arrived in Sykeston from Ohio and began to set forms and raise walls, the people of Pinhook began to surrender their uncertainty and accept the very real possibility that they would actually get new homes. Those two months of construction saw the forging of a surprising communion and the affirmation of a consistent faith between the people of Pinhook and these Amish workers. The unwavering faith of the Amish reflected back to the Pinhookians their own steadfastness. Like Job, they had been tested by God. They, were, they had been visited by calamity and a trial of their faithfulness. And as they saw it, God had finally rewarded them. He had, quote, shown out, as I heard Pinhookian Faye Mack exclaim during Pinhook Day, in May of 2018. They had been faithful and now were rich with blessings. I arrived at the farmhouse where Elaine lived at, uh, used to live outside Columbia, Missouri on the first, last Friday afternoon in May of 2018. We would soon be on our way to attend the first Pinhook Day uh, homecoming to be held since the new houses had been built. Elaine had been down to Saxon a few times during the spring 
watching the construction, meeting the volunteer Amish workers, talking to Deborah, Aretha, Tuan, and others about their homes. When we got in the car together to drive the four hours to the boot hill, our conversation immediately turned to the new houses and our ambivalent feelings about them. On the one hand, we were ecstatic that so many of our research collaborators and friends, our adopted family, now had new homes to live in. But we were also still conflicted. These homes have been built without one dime of direct support from the federal government, the entity we both felt was responsible for the destruction of Pinhook in the first place. Uh, an organization like Mennonite Disaster Services stepping in to organize the building of the new houses was great, but was that justice? Certainly, displaced uh, Pinhook residents deserved that the federal government pay to rebuild what they had destroyed. Could things be made right without that happening? For us, it seemed that even though some help had finally uh, been given to the long displaced residents of Pinhook, justice was still being denied them. After all, uh, all, their, all they ever wanted was to rebuild their town somewhere safe outside the floodway. Instead, they had to settle for a few houses on a street of rental houses in Sykeston, Missouri. In their minds, in our minds, that wasn't enough. We spent the first evening at Deborah's new home, spacious, sturdy, and welcoming. Her new house was already filled with furniture, most of it new. Later she would tell us the story of how a trailer truck had arrived shortly after the houses were completed, loaded with all kinds of furniture, courtesy of the Amish community that had done the building. There was enough furniture in e for each household to have at least one full room set. Many received two. Deborah had gotten couches for her front room, and two full bedroom sets. She called it a kind of miracle of kindness sent to the Pinhook folks by God. She took us through every room in her house, explaining that uh, what was new and what had been saved. There wasn't much there that had been salvaged from her old house out of Pinhook. She had barely gotten anything out, seven year, and seven years of storage had not been kind to any possessions she had been able to save. Elaine and I both felt a deep kind of happiness for Deborah. Finally, after all these years, she had uh, seen a payoff for her work. But we were both still angry at the Army Corps of Engineers and the federal government that had refused to help her after they had destroyed everything she owned. I could see the anger in, on Elaine's face. I could also see a sadness there. And I knew that she had not yet figured out how to tell Deborah what she wanted to say, that she was still angry, that she could not forgive. Neither could I. One, on Sunday morning, the last day of 2014 Pinhook Day festivities, Tuan Robinson, who's um, Deborah's sister, led Sunday school at the VFW Hall in Sykeston, Missouri. There was a small crowd on hand, all adults who had come to hear her message. Tuan gathered us around a couple of tables in the back of the hall and began to speak. What she said was a kind of testimony about what she had been through over the last seven years, and in it she spoke directly to the feelings Elaine and I had about Pinhut. Here's just a small portion of what she said. People look at us when we first started out on this journey, and they were like, how do you do it? How do you give, them, give him praise today? Look at what's happened to you. Look at what Cairo has turned into. And look, and I said, wait a minute, he's the creator. He made us who we are. He gave us the resilience of spirit. He helped us to recover no matter what. He always going to get my praise. No matter what your circumstance, he needs to get your praise. At your lowest, God needs to get your praise. He needs to be honored. He needs to get the glory. So all of this, it means home. It means in every situation, just them bringing that furniture, and then I get some baskets last night, and oh, people want to give me my basket, and I'm just sitting there, just sitting there like, that's for me? And then you give me another basket, and I'm supposed to just sit there and keep a straight face and just hold on, because there's a ride in this, there's so much joy, and I still have not finished getting my blessings. My harvest is not yet complete. My double portion is yet coming. It's a beautiful thing, not just for me, but he didn't just do it for me, he did it for all of those folks who lost their homes. Oh, what a joy that is, but in the midst of that, we had to stay focused, we had to remember our roots. Bless them which persecute you. Bless them and curse not. Now y'all, that one was a little bit difficult. When you think about what time of day it was that the levee was blown, 10.30 at night, and they say, well, you should be angry, and you should do this. Deborah said, be still. And I went to a meeting, y'all, and the woman said, the woman from Illinois said, I'm glad they blew the levee. And if something happened like this again, I hope they blow it again. And I looked at my sister, I looked at Deborah, and I stood up, and she said, don't say one thing. What you mean, I can't say nothing? We have to praise him. Who, me? You want me to praise up right now in this here meeting? So I went, and I stood against the wall. And I was just patting that wall, and I was like, pat, pat, pat. She laughs there. I was hotter than fish grease. But I did not approach her. 
I began to just pray. First of all, I was praying to God, just keep me, keep me, hold that tongue. But then I began to pray for her. I didn't even know what her circumstances or situation was. I don't have a clue. But what I knew at that moment was, I said, bless them which persecute you, bless them and curse not. And I was like, okay, I got to pray blessings, whatever her situation, Lord, let me give her blessings. Keep her, Lord. And I have had to do that on a number of occasions. When you begin to talk to people or you hear stories or you go home, you go down to East Prairie, my home. I'm 649 till I die. And I hear people got mad because they built me a house. For real, y'all? I thought we were beyond that. I thought that part was over. And I got to still, in the midst of that, pray for you and bless you and not curse you, not talk about you, not do any of that stuff. And when I would get real tight, I got real tight. I was like, I'm ready to explode. I would go over there and look at Deborah, and she would say, be still. I was like, I'm so tired. And you like, be still? Ugh. Can we come up with another verse? <laughs> then I would think of my daddy. God bless his soul. The meek shall inherit the earth. But we got through it because God requires that of us. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that do weep. It's okay to have shed some tears. It's okay to rejoice, recognize for what God requires of you. Over the course of an amazing 20 minutes, Tuan explained exactly the way her faith had allowed her to deal with the breach, the flooding, the years of displacement. She admits to feeling frustration and even anger, but those emotions are easily checked away by the power of her faith in God and the wise counsel of her sister, be still. Her whole understanding of the, pre of the previous seven years was distilled through the framework of her faith. As an ethnographic researcher practicing radical listening and trying to observe closely and deeply, I was immediately wowed by this direct explanation of what it was like to go through what Tuan, her family, and the other residents of Pinhook had gone through. I don't think we had ever really heard anyone articulate their experience in this way to that point. Of course, um, one of the reasons for this was that uh, this was the first time we were listening to anyone from Pinhook speak at a point we could in any way call um, after the ordeal. There was certainly a way in which, from the standpoint of a person who now has a house, that particular day in May was the beginning of after. What I heard Tuan describing was the possibility of healing to begin taking place. And for her, that true healing could not begin while she or anyone else still held on to the anger and resentment they had felt at times during the ordeal of displacement. To get through it, and then to recognize and understand what God requires, was central to her approach to beginning her life again. For her, faith in God was a logical framework within which she could accept what had happened, recognize that it was terrible, and begin living again, knowing that she had done only what God required of her. When Tuan was finished, I walked up to her. I, she was glowing like a lamp. I was nervous because I knew I had to say something to her about that amazing testimony she had just given. I told her how thankful I was to have been there to hear her say what she did. But then remembering what Elaine and I had agonized over in the drive down, I said to her in a slightly shaky voice, but, but Tuan, you know I can't accept everything you just said. I just can't let go of the injustice in all this and the fact that you won't get your town back. And she looked at me like an adult sometimes looks at a child who's trying their best to understand something, just not getting it. And she said, that's okay, Todd. You don't have to see it the way that I do. We just see things differently, and that's okay. Elaine and a couple other folks came up to us at that moment and gathered around so, as well. Elaine said something similar to what I had said to Tuan, uh, to Tuan, and Tuan responded to her the same way she had to me. This was the first moment that we really heard her speak about the subject, and then the first time that we told her what our positions were. I even told her that in our book, which we had brought, like we just got the first copy of the book, and we brought it with us to show the people of Penn, and we're so proud. Um, we say, in the book, we say, that this was the injustice done to you. I said that to her, and she said, that's your book. You have the right to say what you want in it. Then she hugged one and then the other of us and walked away with a smile on her face. We all moved up to the front of the room for a blessing from a local minister after that, the son of the former pastor of the Pinhook Union Baptist Church. After he spoke, the audience was invited to come up and speak if they wanted. People came up and talked about their own experiences, what it had meant to be back in Pinhook the day before during their celebration, how much they appreciated that what God had done for them. I sat with my camera in my hand, wanting to say something myself. I looked over at Elaine, who was sitting a couple tables away from me, and gestured towards the front of the room. And then I kind of pointed at myself. 
and she pointed at herself and said, shook her head no, <laughs> and, but she nodded and pointed at me. And so I went up to speak, and I don't even remember what I said in those minutes. I only remember that I wanted to express to the handful of people in the room, several of whom were in the book, that the book was for them, that we couldn't have written it without them. I wanted them to know how much they meant to us, how much they had taught us, how they had inspired us in so many ways, how much it meant that they called us family. I wanted them to know that it was their book, but I knew that it wasn't. Maybe the book does contain the voices and stories of the people of Pinhook. Of course it does. But as Tuan said, the book was ours, and we had said what we wanted to say in it. We had failed. Reciprocal ethnography in theory requires an ongoing and consistent interrogation of position and power. It requires the examination of relationships. It requires that the researcher decenter and subvert the self in order to engage in a radical form of listening, observing, and collaboration. This calls for the most radical kind of vulnerability in which the self must become open to others in a way that can be frightening and feel insecure. In her book, The Vulnerable Observer, Ruth Behar identifies vulnerability as an approach that makes us more fully human in our interactions with others. The essays in her book explore the pain and failures of intimacy between researchers and collaborators, but she concludes uh, that we must dwell in the pain and risk and risk the failure of what we do in order for our work to have any meaning at all. I've always been struck by the final essay of the collection where she describes delivering a heartbreaking conference paper in which she discusses the tragic experiences of anthropologist Renato Rosaldo, who um, only in being completely destroyed by the accidental, um, the grief of the accidental death of his wife, was able to understand why the Alonga people he studied for years engaged in the ritual of headhunting. Rosaldo, in his realizations about the way he had positioned himself with relation to his research subjects, acknowledges the contingency of knowledge and understanding, dismisses more dominant conceptions of truth and objectivity. He writes in his famous article on the subject that, quote, social analysis must now grapple with the realization that its objects of analysis are also analyzing subjects who critically in, in analyze ethnographers. This is, of course, a crucial but well-accepted shift in the attitude of ethnographers towards the people they work with. Behar extends this notion of the importance of positional awareness into the realm of failure and risk. And this vital concept has been, for me, the most, most transformative idea I came to learn while working in the field for these many years. I saw Lane be open to the possibility of failure each time we went down to the boot hill. I participated in examining that feeling on the way down and on the return leg of every trip we made. And when Lane taught me anything, it's that I am in control of nothing and I comprehend even less in the field unless I surrender myself to the reality of the work that we do and the people we do it with. It is work that is consistently and continually a failure. If Elaine and I had failed in fully, to fully understand the power of faith that would allow a group of people who had been deprived of everything to not only accept it, but rest in that reality with happiness and thankfulness, we were simply experiencing the normal kind of failure of ethnography that permeates its very essence. I used to see this failure as something that needed to be corrected, as something that could be fixed with enough hard work or the correct methodological approach. I even formulated in my head an idea of an ethnography of trying, that is, trying, failing, and trying again. But now, after having experienced a failure that I can see is not, in fact, destructive or detrimental to our work with people at Pinho, I can begin to accept the notion that Elaine was teaching me all this time, especially when she performed vulnerability, not just with our research collaborators, but with me as well, in the, our discussions in the car. What if the goals we strive for in research will never be fully achievable? Does that mean we pack up our things and go home? What if we can never fully transcend the frameworks of meaning and perception, which make our conception of what we experience very different from those of the people we work with? What if we want so desperately to help them and advocate for them, but fail to accomplish anything that actually betters their lives? And what if the end of their story doesn't satisfy the notions of social justice and equity that we are looking for? Should we stop trying? Jack Halberstam writes in The Queer Art of Failure, Quote, under certain circumstances, failing, losing, forgetting, unmaking, undoing, unbecoming, not knowing, may in fact offer more creative, more cooperative, more surprising ways of being in the world. Failing is something queers do and have always done exceptionally well. For queers, failure can be a style, to quote Quentin Crisp, or a way of life, to quote Foucault. 
and it can stand in contrast to the grim scenarios of success that depend upon trying and trying again. In fact, if success requires so much effort, then maybe failure is easier in the long run and offers different rewards. Here, Halberstam identifies failure as an imposition of late capitalism and patriarchy, the same tyrannical notions of Western epistemology that Rosaldo rejects and those of the masculinist methodology that Behar discards are intimately tied to our perceptions of what it means to engage successful research, what it means to uh, succeed on behalf of your collaborators, to speak for and with them. And while I do still advocate trying and trying again, meaning quite literally to keep doing ethnography even when it seems futile, I no longer advocate that method as a progressive form of improving towards a successful project. I would contend that the successful project is always a failure, and that ethnography itself is always a failure, and that beca because of, not despite this fact, we should continue to pursue it, dwelling in the failure, being vulnerable, accepting what it means to fail, to understand, to perceive, transcend, and connect. What I believe I have learned is that we as ethnographers are just doing the work, trying and trying, trying and failing, trying and failing again. But there is value in failing. Tuan, if I may presume to speak for her yet again, I believe uh, understood failure as part of God's plan for her and for the residents of Pinhook. She, however, saw God as transforming failure into victory. As ethnographers, we have no gods to save us, only our meager and, and vulnerable selves. But maybe there is something wonderful, wonderful to be found in not knowing, being confused, being lost, striking out, and failing again, and failing miserably. We can be open to failure while also maintaining our commitments and responsibilities as researchers. To repeat the insistence of Calvin Dotson from the beginning of this talk, we will not cease to be scholars as a result. Now is the time for us to move further in identifying and developing ethnographic approaches that embrace failure as inevitable and productive, to, that engage the political and service of advocacy and justice. My work in collaboration with the people of Pinhook has helped me to begin to imagine for myself a group-specific approach that values communities and their places, that recognizes cultural, traditional, and community significance, but that allows for the failures that will inevitably take place in attempting to do such work. For me, this calls for a collaborative ethnography that embraces and encourages the marginalized communities to tell their own stories and to mark their rightful places in the world. Collaborative and community-based research can help uh, enable voices and agency in marginalized communities by working to create environments where research collaborators can be empowered to take agency and wield their own voices in powerful ways. In this end, to this end, I call for an ethnography that engages the political ramifications of place, otherness, invisibility, precariousness. So often qualitative research in communities of color has been undertaken by white scholars with a neutral or objective framework. This so-called neutrality or objectivity in fact obscures and devalues the true nature of communities of color and their places. Following theorists uh, Katrina Sharp, uh, Christina Sh Sharp and Zanzoli Aizoke, I am calling instead for an ethnography that participates in a reconnection with the black past, so for me, the black past, not past, as Sharp puts it, a returning towards black ancestry, black traditions, and black ancestral land. As others have, I call for an ethnography that functions in collaboration with and recognizes the impossible yet necessary project of advocacy for people we collaborate with, an ethnography that interrogates structures of power and oppression that impact marginalized people and communities of color disproportionately, an ethnography that embraces liberatory practices that is radical and speaks along with the folk we collaborate with. Most spe more specifically, I like Isoke call for a distinctively black ethnography that studies the way blackness moves, the way it speaks, the way it articulates itself, and reimagines the world to make itself belong for a fleeting moment in the break. We need a hoodoo ethnography. Hoodoo, in the African American spiritual practice, is as Zora Neale Hurston has explained, improvisational and flexible. It adapts, conforms, borrows from the context it finds itself in contact with. Rather than arriving cloaked in the power and authority of institution, hoodoo ethnography seeks to commune with cultural context and recognize their power and value. As Hurston realized during her negotiation with hoodoo doctor Samuel Thornton, the extraordinarily high price he quoted to her to share his knowledge was not about money at all, but about a way of, of ensuring that she had the power, the, the soul to see. Hoodoo ethnography has the willingness to see, 
to recognize the value of black places, black community, black history, uh, black traditions, and black ancestors, and to imagine the possibilities of a black future. Like Hudu itself, it relies on a belief in the, perme in the permeability of the boundaries between times, between worlds, and between ways of being. Hudu ethnography requires a surrender and vulnerability to another presence that cannot be controlled or even fully understood, that may overtake us without warning. The boundaries to be crossed should be done so in a way that allows us as ethnographers to surrender power and submit to the traditions and histories that lie within ourselves and our collaborators and in the souls of our ancestors. A hoodoo ethnography cannot help but be political and a radical and political. It refuses the imposition of judgment and opens to a radical sensibility of the other and the self. It interrogates injustice. It is open to the horrors and terrors of black existence, past and present, and it roots itself in the beautiful future realities produced by black cultural innovations and improvisations which emerge along with and, and in spite of haunting injustice. I have witnessed this very emergence in my work with the still thriving community of Pinhook. I have witnessed the beauty and the power of this group of people who built a home in a place nobody wanted alongside the Mississippi River. I have been astonished by the beauty of their refusal to be erased by the indifferent and, and powerful oppressor. Had their community been recognized and considered as valuable as the farmland and industrial capital on the other side of the Mississippi, perhaps the decision whether or not to blow the levee might have been taken differently. Returning to that AFS forum that I began this talk with, um, in which my colleagues made a case for a new kind of folkloristics, I want to emphasize that above all, the most important aspect of the way I'm thinking now is built on collaborative work both in terms of research which communities and, um, with communities and working together to transform, excuse me, I messed that up, let me do this again. I want to emphasize that above all, most important aspects of, most important, uh, the most important aspect of the way that I'm thinking now is built on collaborative work, both in terms of research with communities and working together to transform this field. Our collaborations must not only be with those who we work with and who surround us, we should also be in collaboration with those who have come before us and who have so much to teach us. Hurston, Brewer, Cabrera, Lee, Paredes, uh, Gerald Davis, others. We, I believe we can build something new by looking to our ancestors who have already provided us with models we can follow. They have shown us how to be open to others, how to look into ourselves, how to embrace the unknown, how to focus not on what we bring, but on what we are open to. During that session, I was most struck by something Serena Morales said. Um, she said, quote, what if when I entered graduate school, someone had asked me what I already knew instead of trying to get me to emulate something I could never be? For so many of us, this is what happens when we enter the field. Let's build a new folklore where we embrace collaboration failure in ourselves, and instead of training our gaze on others, we invite them in, bringing what they already have, and all work together towards a new and transformed future. Thank you. Sorry, that was a lot to read. So, um, uh, Soli told me I can take questions from you all if you have questions that you want to ask, comment, or complaint, or anything like that. Um, and I'll try to respond. Um, again, thank you for listening. I know that was pretty long, and uh, I did my best to read it. I, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I'll say it now. I'm about two years out from a brain hemorrhage I suffered in February of 2020, I guess. And like, I had to learn how to read again. I lost the ability to read. I have to learn how to read again, and I still have a little bit of trouble. So when I'm stumbling, either sometimes I might stumble trying to get a word or someone's name or something like that. So that's why. So, um, but it's that that is, that's a whole other story. That's been like an amazing experience, a tragic thing, but an amazing experience. So, um, yeah, just want to let you all know that. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Wow, this was great. I really appreciated um, the talk. The focus on collaboration is what I find most inspiring. And I'm wondering if you could talk more about what the collaborative authorial process was like with you in a way. Because not many books are co-authored in our field, unfortunately. And this was one that was brilliantly written by two scholars. Given the fact that we're focusing on collaboration, can you speak to that process of co-authorship? Yeah, yeah. So I'll talk about that. And I just want to say, you know, before I talk about that, that I've really found in the last... I mean, starting with, with working with Elaine, that 
working in teams and collaborations with the other scholars is like so rewarding and it's so like it's fun and it's it's productive and you it helps you find like I can find the space that I'm good at right like the thing that I'm good at and then I can marry it together with something that someone else is good at right and like we can work together and do things that I couldn't do by myself um, I don't think I could write this book have written this book by myself I don't know if everyone knows, um, before this book was finished, Elaine had a health issue where we thought, I thought she was going to die. Um, she had a, you know, a obstruction of ox oxygen to the brain. I went to see her. Um, we had just taken the book from, we, we first had it at University of Missouri Press, and they had been giving us some, they were garbage at the time so they were giving us some trouble <laughs> but we really like figured out we needed to rewrite it and reorder it and so that good came out of it um, but in between that time and when we finally got it to um, uh, University of Mississippi Press Lane had this thing happen to her I went to see her in the hospital and I came out of the room and I thought I'm never going to talk to her again she's going to die and I, I called up actually we still had the book at, you know, at Missouri Press I think, I think we hadn't taken it out yet and I called the um, editor and I was like, I was in tears, like, I don't know what to do. Um, I think Elaine might not make it. I'm sorry, to, I'm telling her personal business and I'm sorry about that, but it's part, it's part of the story. Um, I will finish this book, I don't care what it takes, I'll finish this book, I'll do it for her. But I honestly didn't know if I could do it. And I tell this story because it really speaks to the importance of the collaboration between us because it wasn't easy to write with a book with someone else. It wasn't easy to write a book with Elaine. Like we're all kind of like half crazy somehow, right? Like you know, <laughs> you know, our friends are. We're all kind of half crazy, and I'm sure she must have thought like, I can't believe him. Like he's not doing what I'm asking. So we had like there was lots of there was I don't know tension, con not con those seem like strong words, but I had to like figure out how do I tell my former teacher that I don't like what she wrote here. Like, I think we need to change this, right? So we, I had to sort of figure that out. Um, she had to figure out how to talk with me, tell me stuff that she didn't like without it feeling like she was sort of like imposing her you know, former authority over me. It was really difficult. And we had different ways of working, right? Like, um, she writes a lot. I mean, like, if she's writing 10 pages, she writes like 50 pages to get the 10 pages, right? And I write a lot less than that. So I'm not like 12 pages or something. Uh, but she would write so much, you know, and I'd be like, is this the whole book? Are you just writing the whole book? Like, wait for me, you know? <laughs> and uh, so we figured, we figured out that we had to kind of like, we'll, we'll, um, each one of us will be a captain of a chapter. And so we split the chapters up. And we each started, like, so we started the chapters that we were captains on. And we wrote a kind of a draft of it, and then we gave it to the other person. And then that person wrote into the chapter, um, always sort of tracking everything so we could change it back if you changed something, didn't want to change or whatever. And we just did that back and forth, back and forth. And our, really our, what well, we wanted it, and I don't think it's, it quite uh, achieved this. We really wanted it to sound like one voice all the way through the book. I think there are chapters which sound more like me and more like her. Um, I think that's just like, that just happened. Um, and that's fine, but we, that's what we were trying to do, is to like make it sound like one voice and have it like this kind of like, um, you know, first person plural kind of narrative voice through the book. Um, ultimately, it was a joy to work with her, and it was a joy to work on the book. Um, it showed me, you know, I think it showed me, um, it demystified the sort of being a scholar, because I saw someone doing it right in front of me in a way that I never had before, and I got to do it right alongside of her. Um, it showed me what I was also capable of doing. Um, you know, I, my whole life, like, I haven't really been, I wasn't really a good student. I mean, I was always sort of like trying to catch up with everybody else. Um, even as a, I, I can't remember if I was telling this story to, it might have been Joe, I can't remember, but, um, even when I was in a PhD student, I couldn't I couldn't close the deal. Like I was supposed to do this field work in Jamaica, and like I couldn't do it. I was I went to Perladen and Elaine and said I can't, I'm too afraid. I can't do it. 
And Pilaf was like, well, I guess you can just do African American literature then. You got club courses in that. So I switched over to, that was my primary area, not folklore. And so it was that, that fear that always held me back. Um, but then I saw she was afraid too. I saw that you know the people we're working with were afraid too, like to see other people mm -hmm. that you have formerly sort of constructed in your mind as superheroes, as titans, as like you know people who are impermeable to like this everything that happens in daily life. Like that made it so much easier for me, and that might have been maybe kind of the early um, seed of thinking about failure because you know later I was like, oh my God, everybody's failing. And then when I first ever talked about this at AFS, people were like, oh, I failed too, it's failing. Like everybody really re responded very positively to it. Um, and that made me feel good too, you know, because I was like, okay, they're actually seeing and feeling some of the same things that I'm feeling. Uh, but that, um, that uh, collaboration really helped me both, it taught me about that, but it helped me to get through it as well. <clears throat> so I, I think, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. tell you right now, <clears throat> I'm, you know, I'm still in contact with Tuan and, and Deborah, and over the last, well, since the, um, since the pandemic started, I started getting asked to do a lot more, you know, talks and visit classes and things like that, and I thought, because we're doing this stuff on Zoom, I could have, you know, um, Deborah show up with me, like we used to do back in the day, and so I asked her and Tuan, and Tuan would say, no, nah. she's like, I'm done with that, I'm moving on, right? I'm like, but well, Twan, people still want to hear about your story. Don't you want to tell it? I don't want to tell it. I want you to tell it. And she's like, no, you tell it. I'm done with that. I've moved on. So, I mean, that's like a, a really significant way now that I'm sort of having to deal with or understand that I just have to leave them be because they're in a whole other place. And here I am still, I mean, I just read about their situation. I'm just, I'm always talking about it. In some ways, I'm stuck in it. And that's part of the, the problem at that moment, right, is that I hadn't thought about what it meant to be, what it would mean to be after, what it would mean for this to be over. And I don't think that I was really, I don't think I was like desiring for it to go on for something that I wanted. I just hadn't been able to like process it in the way that she had. I didn't have the tools that she had. I didn't have that faith in the way that she had. And I still was holding on to the anger, which I think came partially because of how closely I had sort of, I mean, I talked to them and really felt what they'd been through, and it pissed me off, you know? And I just couldn't let go of it. Um, and even now, I still am angry. But that's okay, because Twan said it was okay. <laughs> I can live with that. I can live with that. Yeah? Sort of stuck by the, um, you know, the, you're, you're talking about hoodoo ethnography, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about Kirsten. Um, you know, part of what she did was uh, was the form of the writing, right? And in mm -hmm. some ways, that was one of the things that was sort of disparaged about her work was mm -hmm. the, the sort of artistic dimension. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of stuck to your own presentation. I thought it was beautiful and artful. And what it does is testify mm -hmm. to the human experience. And um, I wonder how much that might be part of, you know, of the power of the work that you're talking about. And I was just wondering if you have thoughts about, about that. Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I, I really i am thinking about the kind of whole person. I mean, I, I, I talked a little bit about this at AFS, you know, like like you said, Zorno Hersena, who I was using as a kind of uh, model for a particular kind of work, right? Um, she walks, like if the, if the work is that room, she puts on her best dress and she walks right through the door with everybody else. And she brings everything that she has, everything that she is, into the room, into the work. And so, to me, that was like a model for bringing your whole self, but also not to take 
not to come in and hope to impose something. Like I come in with academic authority, or I come in with this, or I come with that. Like that was a thing that Elaine and I, I think we did at the beginning. We sort of, we never said this really out loud, but I think we thought like we're from universities. Like we should be able to come in and like solve this problem pretty quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Like we know who to talk to. Like we didn't know any of that shit. We know who to talk to. We didn't know like what grants they should be. We didn't know any of that stuff. We we re I think it just was pretty quick that we were like, oh, we don't really know anything that we think that we know. Instead, it has to be what you're open to, right? Like you come through the door with your whole self, but you're open to what may happen that you cannot predict, how you may feel, the relationships that may either develop or the ways that they may not develop, um, the ways that you might imagine them to be, but they aren't really. I mean, this is a thing that we thought about a lot too, which was that, you know, when Deborah said, you guys are family. Deborah's never met my wife. Deborah has never been in my house. Uh, Deborah has, she doesn't know my wife's name. She always talks, she always says, tell your lady friend I said hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, she was, and I, you know, I didn't, I don't say, like, oh, her name is Lucia. I don't, I, I don't say that. Like, that's the way our relationship is. Um, and that's probably the way it will always be. I don't anticipate that my wife is going to come to me, come with me to Pinhook. Probably, my parents have been there. My parents, we, well, I don't, they haven't been to Pinhook. They've met. Um, the Pinhook folks at an event. And that was like probably as close as they have an entree into my life. Um, one time I met Deborah at the Mall of America, which is the only time I've ever been to that monstrosity. <laughs> I met Deborah at the Mall of America probably, I don't know, four years ago now or something like that. And that was as close as she's been to like my house. You know, so she was in the Twin Cities, her brother lives in Eau Claire, I think. And we met at the Mall of America. And I don't think I like, Consciously was like, I'm not inviting her over to my house. But when she said, let's meet at the Mall of America, I was like, oh, sure, yeah, I'll do that. I didn't say, no, no, come to my house, Deborah. But she invited me to her house the first time we met. Awesome. You know? She invited us, cook, let me cook you dinner. Stay here. The first night we met them, stay here. No, we have a hotel. No, 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 cancel the hotel, stay here. Ah, I like a hotel. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I think, yeah, that, that sort of, fullness that you're trying to do but maybe you can't always achieve but also the fullness of self which opens out into other kinds of um, other ways of being with folks mm -hmm. other ways of understanding folks you know other ways of being present with them absolutely you know I think that's a big part of it other questions do I have time so yeah okay. Um, following on this idea of food ethnography and family, and to, especially towards the end of your presentation, I was really struck by how you were talking about ancestors and kind of bringing that presence into yeah. into the room. How much is kinship, like when you're thinking about, you know, these movements of negotiations and failures and all that, how much uh, is kinship an orientation or doing the work um, that you have done and also maybe the work that you will be doing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the way I can answer that question is to say, you know, because I was just sort of saying about how Deborah says I'm her family. Yeah. And I believe that in a way I am. I believe that she's my family in a way. I hope that our relationship continues to be a relationship, continues to be a thing. But, you know, I have to acknowledge the ways in which that might not happen. Uh -huh. um, but there is a kind of way in which we have shared something together, been through something together yeah. that is never going to go away. Right. Um, and the kindness, the generosity, everything that she showed to us from the very beginning, I'll never forget that. Yeah. And she probably won't either. Right. Um, but then, on top of that, there is the way that, I mean, really, I should be paying like endless amounts of money to the pen up people because they taught me so much. Mm. And the, the most, maybe the most important thing for me personally that they taught me was that I should listen to the ancestors. Mm. That I was rooted somewhere, like I have a place. I saw how much their place meant to them. Yeah. 
And I'm a person, like, I'm, I grew up moving around. I, don't, I mean, I have a hometown, but sometimes I say it's Kansas City. Sometimes I say it's Carthage. I say it different places because, frankly, like, I really didn't really care. My family's really from Pennytown, Missouri, a black town in central Missouri. That's where my family is really from. But I never understood how important that place was when I was younger until I went to Pinhook, until I spent time with those people. And I saw how they built community, how they maintained community, even when that place was destroyed. And they still go back there. Um, Deborah, so in that same year, 2018, when they had their homecoming after the houses were built, uh, the guy who built the, who runs Mennonite Disaster Services, um, Jeff Kohler, Kohler, I think, um, he sort of secretly built them a giant um, picnic shelter out at Pinhook. And so out at Pinhook, all the houses are gone, and they can't really build any habitable structure, nothing with walls. Um, but they could have this shelter. He built it for them basically as a surprise. And so at some point during that weekend, let's go out to Pinhook, and there was this 20 foot by 60 foot um, picnic shelter, roof on it, and everything, and, and it was like great, and everyone was super happy, and Deborah was ecstatic, and Jeff said to her, so it doesn't have a floor, it's just like a, the grass, and he said, I promise you, I will come back, and I will put a floor, we'll pour a floor in here, so you can use it like when it's raining or whatever. And Deborah said, no, no, I don't want a floor. I want to take my shoes off and have my feet in the soil, mm -hmm. the soil of my town, of my place where my people were. And I'll never forget that. And I thought to myself, I have that too. I have that too. Why haven't I been valuing that, right? And so now, you know, my, um, we are in the process of trying to like get our land back. We don't even own the land that our church, the only, have, or the only structure at, at Pennytown is, a, is an old church. And we don't own that land anymore. And so we're trying to get that land back because I finally realized my whole family, I don't know why I'm saying, my whole family knew it. I didn't understand, I didn't know it, I didn't recognize it. So that kind of lesson for me has been invaluable. And the connection to, between me and those people who live there, I mean, my mom, has been doing, you know, family history for years. And uh, she would be like, Todd, I have to tell you about this, blah, blah, I found this. And I'd be like, oh, okay, whatever, Mom. I've got important <laughs> academic things to do over here. <laughs> Can you leave me alone? And, um, but after, I, after this, I was like, oh, tell me more. Tell me about my relatives. Tell me about my ancestors. The other day, they, she sent me a contract, a labor contract, between my three-time great-grandfather and his former owner, in Virginia in 1866, right? And I was like, what? What? I took it to class and used it in class. My students were like, what? <laughs> what? We looked at it, right? And I mean, 15 years ago, I would have been like, oh, that's nice, Mom. I got other stuff to do. But now I recognize the power of that, of looking to the ancestors, looking to history, looking to the past, and what, you know, because we always think the best thing is in front of us. But what if it isn't? What if the best things are some of the, some of that? What is in front of us that's good is rooted in what's behind us, right? What if those things are tied together? And the ability to imagine transformative futures relies upon a connection or rootedness in the past and an acknowledgement of our ancestors, what they've given us. You can't just walk away. Which is what I used to do every time we moved. I would just leave that town behind and go to the next town and start a new life, I thought. But I wasn't really doing that. My mom would say, why don't you, these people are writing you letters. Why don't you write a letter back to them? I said, well, I'm never going to see them again, Mom. Why well, am I going to write them a letter? Let me just move on with my life. But now I realize these people I never saw before, my third time great-grandfather, Nelson Piper, who I never met, never saw, never imagined, now have to recognize that connection. Do have time for any more? Yeah. Or the will for any more? Yes. <laughs> um, just to thank you. And, um, and I think what, what you have just sort of described as this successful failure is, is that's what Pogba has always been. And, you know, sort of coming from 
um, the Irish perspective. Um, you know, those, what Deborah said, you know, anyone who's done field work in Ireland has heard that, you know, why don't you just sleep on my living room couch? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why we have what we have. And, of course, it's faulty, you know, and it's, it started, my God, it started in early 19th century. Of course, mm -hmm. <laughs> it wasn't Had perfect, right? right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but we have what we have because people have always tried their mm -hmm. best and have given us and have provided this platform for people who otherwise whose voices we wouldn't have mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you are in the best yeah. tradition of this Thank great, you. Um, epic. <laughs> Yeah, I, and I think we have to failure, we have to keep doing it, right? Like keep trying and keep trying, and I don't know, like maybe the experience of feeling like um, I mean, I think this obviously is sort of separate from what I began with, but like this feeling of being disciplined by the discipline, you know, of feeling that if you push in certain directions that you can't, well, you can't go there. Um, but this sort of opens doors to go to those places where we dare not look. You know, I'm doing like a, a, do, a doom. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm obsessed with doom. I'm not place where you're doing. Um, but yeah, like this gives us a, a possibility and a way to go in those directions that we maybe wouldn't have gone before and to, um, to open ourselves up to things we might not have been open to before. So, yeah, thank you.